Welcome to our webinar. Um, the last one, um, obesity organized in the framework of the EU funded Jamone network uh, Trapoco, transnational contention in Europe. I am delighted to welcome Roland Erne, Professor of European Integration and Employment Relations at the University College Dublin, which is a member of our Trapoco network. Um, and our discussant, Devi Sacchetto, Professor of Sociology of Work at the University of Padua. I am Luisa Chiodi. I am the director of OBCT, one of the partners of this Trapoco network that concludes today its first three-year project uh, led by Scuola Normale Superiore. Um, uh, with our network, we gathered universities and think tanks from different disciplinary areas and different countries to study the role of societal actors, such as uh, movement, non-governmental organization, activists, trade unions, in strengthening the space of rights and democracy in Europe with contention, and in particular, transnational contention. We contributed to, hopefully, to the advancement of the research in this field of transnational political dynamics in Europe, looking at practices of mobilization and protest that uh, cross the border of nation states and have an impact on the functioning of democracy. We focused on issues such as environmental protection, climate justice, migration, labor policies, anti-discrimination, which are all areas covered by a considerable community aki on which transnational alliances and mobilizations emerged more and more often. Today, the topic of our discussion is the transnationalization in the sphere of healthcare that did not used to be um, a, a European sphere. On the opposite, it used to be an it, exclusive domain of national policy making. But after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, what have emerged uh, was that the, a new EU economic governance that enabled the EU to intervene in the healthcare sphere. Roland Erne today will present the research uh, work published with Sabrina Stan on this EU prescription in the healthcare in Germany, Ireland, Italy and Romania. And um, as observed by Roland and, and how he will explain to us um, how this um, prescription favored the commodification of services um, across all the countries studied. So the discussion moves then to, to assessing the potential for these transnational collective actions of trade unions and social movement that could be triggered by um, this new uh, situation. Um, basically, what we discussed are aspects that are crucial, according to us, for the prospect of European democracy and uh, of the role of labor movement in the advancement of social welfare at the EU level. So um, over to you, Roland, for your presentation. So thank you very much um, to Lisa, to the entire Trapoco network, uh, to be part of this network in the first place and to have the honor to be the last uh, event, be part of the last event of the network. So today we are going to present a paper that Sabina Stan and I have written and recently published with Socioeconomic Review. Uh, we analyzed the policy orientation of the EU's prescriptions in relation to health care from 2009 to 2019. And uh, the question behind that is, can we see an overarching commodification script going across these countries? Because that is a necessary, but of course not sufficient precondition of joint counter movements uniting workers across Europe and as users of public service across Europe against this commodifying regime. So that is the, the idea. So the focus or the end point is transnational collective action. So we are interested in transnational collective action of trade unions and social movements in healthcare. But as you have said, Luisa, um, healthcare is, is an area where when you read the treaties, literally, literally, there is actually no EU competence. On the contrary, if you read the treaties, it says explicitly that healthcare governance is a matter of nation states. So in the first step, we have to explain the shift uh, in EU economic um, governance, which led to a, 
an, a shift of the EU's nominal competence to the actual competence in healthcare. Then we analyze the policy directions of these, and then we see whether there is a potential for transnational action. So the starting point is the Maastricht Treaty. And uh, in the Maastricht Treaty, we have an article in the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which is also an independent title, the so-called public health title. And, and that was done uh, in anticipation of um, transnational pandemics and transnational diseases. So there was an idea, okay, the EU should be able to do something if something like that happens across border. But if you read the, the article still today, it's very limited. And now um, it has been revised also in, uh, more recently to be really very narrow in scope. But that hasn't prevented uh, the competence, the de facto, the material conditions of EU interventions in the area of healthcare. So we have to explain why did that happen? It happened in two steps. So the first spillovers happened in the 1990s and 2000s, and they were linked to the creation of the monetary union and the creation of the internal market. And of course, also the EEC accession criteria. So as you will see later, we look at Romania as well. And, um, and uh, so Eastern European countries were forced to take over the so-called Aki communautaire, so the body of laws in this field. So the monetary union led to fiscal constraints. And as fiscal constraints um, are linked to public expenditure, we have seen in many member states, also in Italy, in particular in Italy, pressures to cut back on healthcare expenditure. Uh, we have seen similar pressures in Germany. Um, Although Germany has a system of healthcare that is not based directly on state expenditure, but on sickness funds, which are paid out of payroll taxes. So in Germany, Schröder also introduced a, a very dramatic healthcare reform in the 2000s, 2003. Uh, but that was explained not by the Maastricht uh, uh, monetary union criteria, but it was explained by internal market pressures. So it was explained as a result of internal market pressures, German wage come under competition, they are higher than in other places, so we should reduce labor costs or contain labor costs. And it was decided to cut or to put in a ceiling on payroll taxes for sickness funds, which then also triggered commodifying healthcare reforms as in Italy. Um, then we, we went on with, in the 2000s, um, the more uh, these reforms introduced healthcare operators that were operating in the private sector, the more um, competition law became an issue. Um, so, and state aid to private companies. So we have had several a legal battle on, on these kind of issues, which further increased the commodification of the sector. The European Union, Mr. Wolkenstein, wanted to go further in the service directive, in the so-called service directive, to commodify healthcare on, uh, by declaring it as a public, maybe public, but a service like any, any other service covered by the free movement of service laws. But as you see, the letter is red there. Bolkenstein is red because there was a huge transnational protest movement triggered by this proposal. And one of the successes of, the, of that movement was that healthcare was explicitly excluded from the Bolkenstein directive. Even so, um, we have then seen some smaller cross Border care laws and regulations, um, taking up some ideas of the Wolkenstein Directive, but more on a peaceful way. So the pressure still went on. But nevertheless, we could say until 2008, 
there was still no direct intervention in the operation of healthcare services. This changed with the financial crisis. And why did that change? Because business leaders and also political executives changed their view on social policy and labor policy. Until 2008, they thought that horizontal market pressures alone would be enough to trigger healthcare reform. We don't need to prescribe particular prescriptions what reforms in healthcare member states had to adopt. But uh, then they had to realize that the increased horizontal market pressures created by the monetary union and the inter internal market didn't lead to a convergence of the European economies, but to major macroeconomic imbalances, which would lead possibly to the breakup of the whole euro area and the breakup of the whole European Union. So therefore, I had the doubtful privilege to meet actually Troika representatives in Ireland and government meetings. And a colleague of mine challenged the representative of TG Economics of Finance from the European Commission and said, your neoliberal ideas don't work. And then surprisingly, he stood up and said, yes, you're right. We acknowledge that the market didn't do its job. That's why we are here to do the job by political interventions uh, directly ourselves. So, and that led to the introduction of this new economic governance regime. First, using MOUs, memorandums of understandings in countries like Ireland. But it would be wrong to think that this is only related to Euro area countries. Also, we have seen MOUs in non-Euro countries like Romania. And then some in 2011, this um, approach was extended to all member states by a six pack, which is a bit a strange name, isn't it? But it's just six laws of the EU, which reinforced the stability and growth pact, but introduced a new macroeconomic governance um, procedure to prevent so-called macroeconomic imbalances. And when you read that law on macroeconomic imbalances, you ask the question, um, what is the macroeconomic imbalance or what is an excessive macroeconomic imbalance? And the answer is everything that can, quote, threaten the proper functioning of the European economy or risk to do so. So it's not necessarily an effect that has to happen, but it, the risk itself is enough to justify EU interventions in that field. So um, what we now do is we analyze this new economic governance regime. I said it started with the financial crisis, first the bailout programs, and these had hard conditionalities. If you didn't follow these hard conditionalities, you are fined. But then you had the Euro crisis, the European semester, which is the annual cycle of macro policy coordination that follows uh, from the so-called six-pack laws and this new um, Faces the excessive deficit procedure, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure. If you don't follow corrective action plans under these two, you risk financial fines, quite substantial ones, 0 0.2 of GDP per annum or 0 0.1 GDP per annum. And by doing the European semester, they also reintroduced uh, the Europe 2020 growth strategy, the former open method of coordination which also included some social ideas of social coordination, as we have seen in the 2000s. But interestingly is, when we analyze the NAC prescriptions, we always have to have in mind to which phase of NAC this prescription is related to. Because not all NAC prescriptions have the same coercive power, as you can see here. So social prescriptions based on the Europe 2020 strategy have no actual sanctioning power unless naming and shaming. 
Whereas if you don't do what is asked you to be done, you risk sanctions. Or then in two, since 2013, you also risk the withdrawal of EU cohesion funds. So because the European Union realized it's actually very difficult to sanction a country, but it's very easy not to pay EU funds. Um, if you didn't do that, okay, that's your choice. But then you don't get any money for uh, whatever project you have in the EU. So that's the starting point. And now we, uh, as you see, this European semester regime operates differently to the classical method of governance. So the classical method of governance is we have a European law like the Bolkenstein Directive. And, and that helped actually producing counter reactions by and counter movements because everybody knew, ah, this law is coming. We have to come together. We have to mobilize against that. And everybody is concerned at the same time. Here, um, the, the NAG regime is more difficult because it is a supranational regime because these prescriptions are drafted by the European Commission and then adopted by the European Council of Finance Ministers. But not each country gets the same recommendations, so um, which makes it then difficult to come together on a transnational European level. But um, you can do it for, for a while. And as we are industrial relations scholars, we have seen similar processes also in multinational corporations, where multinational corporations actually govern in a very similar way. So they also attack subsidiaries with restructuring plans on a subsidiary by subsidiary basis. But after a while, when works councillors and trade unions talk to each other, they realize they're actually facing the same challenges. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the prescriptions and see how, in which orientation they are uh, pursuing. And uh, that is kind of a summary table of the NAC prescriptions from 2008 nine to 2019 for Germany, Italy, Ireland, and Romania. On the very left side, you see we have found some decommodifying prescriptions, or we could also say social prescriptions. But then on the bottom, we have found um, very many commodifying prescriptions. And then we have found here in the yellow, um, a prescription, which is actually the most prominent one, which is called increase the cost effectiveness of the healthcare system. And when countries receive that, uh, you don't directly know when you read that, you don't directly know what is actually meant by that. Uh, because you can actually interpret that prescription in two ways. You could treat more people with the same amount of money. So if you are more effective, we can be better for the public and treat more people with the same amount of money. Uh, so in order to understand what is really meant, we analyzed only these four countries where we speak the language and where we understand the context. And then we also analyze the supporting documents, not only the prescriptions, the so-called country reports of the European Commission to understand what is actually meant. So when we look at this prescription, increase the cost cohesiveness of healthcare system, we saw it's always meant to mean the same level of service with less money for healthcare. So that's why we put it in the commodifying box. Um, what is also important is, given the fact, as I mentioned, that healthcare is supposedly not a European, uh, not a competence of um, the European Union. Um, uh, on the left side, 
So we have on the bottom um, clear prescriptions about reducing service levels. So reduce bed capacity or streamline hospital services, which meant actually closing hospitals. So uh, these, these prescriptions are very detailed, surprisingly detailed. Or you have um, prescriptions on the right side, in the middle, introduce co-payments for users of health services to access health services. Um, but then you see there is a contradiction uh, in the commodifying box, a decommodifying box uh, just above, you have the sentence increase access uh, to healthcare. Uh, and that is meant uh, addressed for instance, to Romania because um, Roma people or other people in rural area don't have easy access to the healthcare system. Uh, so there is a contradiction. But now, in order to understand uh, which one prevails, we have to, as we mentioned before, look at the legal body of these prescriptions. And then we see that introduce co-payments was justified with macroeconomic and fiscal stability, therefore legally binding, whereas the other one was justified as a social goal, which is not legally binding. And then somebody else asked, but nevertheless, how can we explain that the Commission and the Council of Finance Minister proposes two things at the same time, which seem to be contradicting each other? The answer to that is, of course, is actually uh, this European economic governance system is doing what Negri and others from Padua 20 years, 30 years ago said would happen. It or 50 years ago, 40 years ago. <laughs> um, it is, now we have um, the whole Europe as one factory, so to speak. And we have a business plan for the whole European Union and all different departments of the European Commission contribute something. Uh, so we have a, a standardized, for researchers is interesting. So we have a standardized policy prescription handbook across all sectors in one document to make the European factory work. And then, of course, there are different people in the European factory and the people from DG employment, they thought, ah, we must do something for our Roma people or our disenfranchised people in the rural area in Romania. And then the DG finance people said, OK, let's put that in. But at the same time, let's also, of course, we want to have introduced co-payments. But then you don't need to be an economist to understand if if you have to pay huge co-payments, Roma people won't just have the money to access it. Just as an example of a little case in this. But let's go back to the bigger picture. Um, we, we see um, on the one side, worse working and employment conditions uh, linked to reduced funding, uh, managerialization of the healthcare systems, introduction of new methods of hospital financing, um, finance ministries taking over the control over hospital budgets, for example, and then decreased access to healthcare workers. So that's, I think, that the two, uh, decreased access to uses of healthcare. And on the other side, however, we also see um, a very different targeting of these prescriptions across time. I don't know whether you see, because now our, our, our nice picture cover possibly on your laptop or your screen, uh, what is written on the right hand side of the PowerPoint. So the black means uh, very constraining, the gray means constraining, and the white means not constraining. And then we have different symbols for different types of interventions, like access to the organization and resources in relation to public services. So what do we see here? We see on the one side, a different targeting across time. So in the acute phase of the crisis, most interventions were first very black, so very constraining. Uh, and later, they were not that big, not that clear anymore. But that doesn't mean that um, uh, 
the European semester is more social when you are demanding less harsh interventions in the second phase. Another interesting thing is uh, that there is a distinction between the two bigger countries, Germany and Italy on the one side, and Ireland and Romania. So Ireland and Romania gets much more, many more prescriptions of directly speaking to the healthcare sector. <laughs> You know, our PhD student Constanza, she analyzed the implementation of NAG in Italy in relation to healthcare. And she showed that although there was no prescription directly linked to healthcare, uh, she showed that the prescriptions about cutting back public expenditure were translated in effect later on in healthcare, commodifying healthcare reforms in Italy. So. The fact that Italy is blank there doesn't mean that NEG didn't affect Italian healthcare, but it just means that only in Ireland and Romania, the healthcare system attracted so much attention that the European officials thought we must address that directly. So why do we see this difference? We would say that the answer lies in the history. Italy and Germany, as mentioned early on, had major healthcare reforms already in the 2000s, whereas Ireland and Italy, Romania didn't. As a result of the, of the healthcare reforms in, in Germany and Italy in the 2000s, the share of private profit for profit hospitals was much higher, is much higher in Germany and Italy, and Ireland and Romania lagged behind. So in some sense, um, uh, and then when we look now what happened in 2017, where the latest data we had, we see, ah, these reforms in the early 2010s made the difference. So we have seen an increased um, shift uh, of the private sector in uh, Irish and Romanian healthcare as a result of these reforms. So what we can say is the, the targeting of Ireland and Romania um, is a case of reverse differentiated integration. So classically differentiated integration means opt out. Okay, a country specific, um, uh, it, Denmark doesn't want to introduce the euro because they want to have it differently. It's okay, let Denmark to be outside the euro. But here the logic is reverse. It's we do country specific intervention targeting the counters that are behind in the commodification agenda in order to make sure that they catch up with the countries that already did the commodifying healthcare reforms before. So what are the political implications of our research? First, I think um, we, um, there are some people arguing, ah, let's do a socialization of the the NAC prescriptions. But the problem of that approach is, and of course I'm in favor of more social NAC prescriptions, the problem is um, that um, uh, such an approach doesn't take account that the NAC prescriptions are much more undemocratic compared to the normal EU laws. So the normal EU laws need to be approved by the European Parliament. And, and that was crucial for the protests in the Bolkenstein case, because it was the European Parliament that introduced the amendments to exclude healthcare from, from the, per, uh, the, the, the directive on uh, the free movement of services. So in my view, it's much more better to have a European directive on minimum standards, like we have now one on minimum wages, we should have one on minimum standards for the provision and people's access to healthcare. Then we should strengthen the protection of healthcare services from EU competition law. Then currently there is still the last moments of discussion about the revised stability and growth pact, which will come into force again after it was suspended during COVID. And, um, and unfortunately the news is a bit mixed, not very good. So. There are some clauses we need to study them in detail and analyze what will happen now in the future. Um, there are some social clauses in the new stability and growth pact, but I'm I'm not holding my breath on that. 
But then most important thing, the last point is we should make sure that EU funding is not used only to boost private profit, but it's used to fight the staff crisis in healthcare. Why I'm saying that? Why do I say that? The answer is that after COVID, we have seen a dramatic shift in a sense that the European Union for the first time established the so-called COVID recovery funds, the RFF. Um, and money was given to member states to increase spending uh, in important areas, including health care. But there was a kind of a Pontius Pilatus approach uh, in relation to that. Because guess what? We come back to the first slide. Now the European officials say, sorry, member states, you cannot use the EU money for staff. Why not? What do you think? Because the EU has unfortunately no competence in the area of the management of healthcare system. So you can use the EU money only for the infrastructure. So to build hospitals, or to which helps, of course, the private builders, private construction companies, or to introduce IT systems, which helps Google and the other IT companies. And maybe there is a bit of leeway. We will accept if you do a training program for staff or some training stuff, things, but you, you shall not use the money to increase wages for nurses, as, as I've said, because that is a national competence. Um, and then that's not all, because they give you the money only if you do something in turn. So now um, we have um, the logic of the Troika applied to all member states. Because you don't get the EU funds from the recovery fund. You don't get it unless you do structural reforms. And we did analyze the structural reforms that are now in the so-called national recovery plans. And we have seen that in many areas, in most areas in relation to public services, they are, are it's again a conditionality to increase the communication managerialization of public services. So it's again linked to this public money for private gain approach, uh, which is a bit unsettling, of course. Um, but ironically, in some other si side, we have seen also opposite direction. So in, in terms of wages and minimum wages, and that shows that political mobilization is important, um, we have seen a change. And in Romania, uh, in 2022, in December, uh, the European government introduced uh, a new industrial relations law that uh, re-legalized political strikes, for example, and reintroduced collective bargaining at the sectoral level, which was abolished during the Troika years. So that is not part of, of, um, of our presentation, but it's part of a book that... Um, uh, we did together as a ERC project, not only Sabina Stan and Roland Erne, but also Dara Golden, Vincenzo Macaron and Imre Sabo. Uh, Dara and, Vin and Imre were also part of the Trapoco network. And if anybody wants to have an uh, informal open access copy um, of the proofs, uh, just send me an email and I'm happy to send you the PDF of the book which will be published in May, but which is already there as a PDF. So that's our concluding slide. So what did we see now in relation to transnational collective action? We did actually see an increasing awareness of trade unions across Europe that there is something going on. And you see here on the left, the demonstration on the 9th December 2022, which will be on the cover of our book, actually. And you see the Romanian flag, uh, CCL, but also German Verde, Verde Union, uh, UGT, etc. So it is really, ironically, the public service workers, and in particular in, in healthcare, that realize that... Um, Transnational action is something that we must do together. We must mobilize. 
There is also a European network on the right. You see European network, our health is not for sale, which brings in also social movements and unions like Sud in France that are not part, so more kind of COPA style unions that are not part of the European federations like EPSU, the European Public Sector Union Federation. And they plan a, a European demonstration on the 7th of April in 2020 also to to um, put pressure on uh, politicians in view of the European elections in June 2024. So that concludes my talk. Thank and you. Here is my my mobile uh, my email, and if you want a copy of the book, write to me, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Roland, for this uh, very clear presentation on such a complex issue. Um, I don't want to um, steal time for, for the comments of uh, the public, but first of all, um, I'm glad to leave to Devi Sacchetto the first uh, ob observation on your presentation. Devi, the floor is yours. Thanks, Luisa. Hi, everybody. It was grateful to, for the opportunity to discuss uh, on Sabina and Roland the paper, which indeed found to be a terrific article, but also sadly a very timely one. I think in Italy in particular, the discussion about this is wide and uh, it's a, a daily experience of a large part of population of this process that are coming up. I found that the operationalization of the concept of commodification for how it unfolds in the healthcare sector to be remarkable. In particular, I appreciate uh, how Sabine and Roland framework was both wide in scope and encompassing, taking into account processes that are related to healthcare assets and processes that are related more directly to healthcare work. And at the same time, process in identifying and naming all the different ways in which European Union executives have suggested the commodification processes distinguishing, for example, between processes pertaining involving the curtailment of resources to those involving the reorganization of services and how Roland said before about also working condition. I think both scholars and activists can learn a lot from your analysis. However, I was not so much asked to comment on the paper itself, but rather to provoke and facilitate a discussion on the potentiality of NED prescription to become triggers of transnational collective action. I will thus proceed by sketching out first those features of NED prescription that might lead the later to become such uh, triggers, and then those features that, uh, on the contrary, seem to me a non-stopable to their politicization. I hope in this way to stimulate uh, a discussion. As Sabine and Roland point out so convincingly in the paper, negative prescription follow common comod commodifying script across countries. And as such, they certainly have the potential to trigger transnational collective action. However, so far in the field of healthcare, the things that have been most followed at the transnational European level have been collaboration between unions to enforce the working time directive on healthcare workers in their own countries, those appealing to a decommodifying directive. In my narrow field of observation, it seems to me that the unions prefer to focus on what little was favorable at the European level and the call for its implementation at the national level, rather than challenge European commodification policies. I would also add that some small collective actors are aware of the different scales from which commodification processes in healthcare move. And also large trade union, or at least some of them, are aware of the direction of European policies. The problem is that all these actors are rather weak, at least in Italy. Can we really expect a meaningful transnational action when the debt at the local and national level is so weak? Of this, 
I do not want to make a rule that are certainly movements that are born transnational. However, here is a reality that needs to be taken into more serious consideration when discussing, discussing transnational movements, in my opinion. Another aspect that we have to keep in mind for the healthcare sector and for the public sector more in general is that how Roland said just at the end, competition among member states potentially fostered by European Union executive evaluation of each country is that subject to international competition. In this regard, Healthcare is different from other sectors, in which workers from different countries might be dissuaded from collaborating to rather engage in concessionary, concessionary collective bargaining. In fact, workers in the public health sector of one EU country is not in direct competition with the workers of other countries. On the other hand, I think we are all very aware that there are also many obstacles getting into the way of transnational collective action against the neck, neck prescription in the field of healthcare. Again, Roland, in his past studies, has highlighted how, unlike European Union directives, neck prescription operate country by country, thus potentially in his home onwards nationalizing social conflict. Related to this, I have also to say that how Roland and Sabina highlight the question of a spatial temporal deployment of neg prescription is crucial, both because each European Union country is in a different starting situation from all the other countries, and because each country has a different political room for maneuver. However, since each government is left a certain degree of room in how and to what extent to implement the NAG prescription, NAG prescriptions are often not visible enough for collective actors to politicize them, even at the national level. This is even more the case with governments which do not voice this content regarding such prescription. So, one of the questions I think that we could discuss, discuss is what are the differences during this, the last 10 years, 2009, 2019, and on the basis of different government that we had, and how have change in the governments of European countries and change in the European Commission affected the implementation of NEG? On the, another topic that uh, <clears throat> is not so um, central to the discussion today, maybe, but I think it could be <clears throat> a good example. The COVID-19 pandemic made more visible than ever the role of the European Union in securing or not access to healthcare. I know that in your paper, you do not address issues related to pharma and vaccines, but I think that indirectly, European Union visibility in the purchasing of vaccines during the pandemic, as well as its decision in terms of regulating patents, could contribute also to the politicization of net prescription in the healthcare sector. Finally, I would argue that the very depth of the hermeneutical work that you and Sabina had um, to put in place to prove NEGS commodification direction speaks of the hard time collective actors and the European population more at large would have in assessing NEGS three. In other words, if NEGS impact is still being debated by scholars, I would expect, expect its commodifying potential not to be immediately identifiable by the European Union population. I stop here, so we have some time to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, David. The, um, <laughs> your last point was indeed <laughs> um, particularly um, in, in, curious and interesting, and um, the issue of awareness. Uh, if we not, don't even have the academic community aware, how can we possibly have a public opinion? But in general, of course, 
was the issue of awareness um, before um, public mobilization um, is fundamental and in general transnational mobilization is especially difficult to obtain so um, i would like to know whether there is anyone in the public um, uh, that would like to raise hand and uh, um, make comments or address questions to our speaker Roland or our discussant in, in that case. You can address it in as many languages as you want as, <laughs> because Roland speaks Italian fluently, um, uh, German as mother tongue, English we have seen, I guess a few others, so feel free to. Okay. So maybe then I can maybe start or respond to Davy's comments, which are uh, very important. And Davy um, put forward a lot of important questions. And, and um, let me start with the problem that we are facing. Yes, uh, it is difficult to see the impact of NAG, as we argued earlier, as Davy said. Uh, given the country-specific deployment of the prescriptions, given the technocratic language, which is, of course, part of the approach to mystify, you know, a cost-effectiveness of healthcare system. We talked about that as a as a as a as an example. Um, but on the other hand, I'm I'm. Uh, that was precisely also the role, our role as public intellectuals to analyze what's going on and to demystify what's going on and to make clear what is actually meant. And, and then uh, when you go back to the slide with our um, book, we called the title of the book is Politicizing Commodification. And this title is different from Hans-Peter Kriers' title uh, some years ago, which was called Politicizing Europe. And I think that is precisely the problem that many confederal trade unions in Italy are seeing. So when you talk to them and we interview them, they are, the experts are, of course, aware of the commodifying bent of NAC, but they are reluctant to politicize it because they fear that it will feed into this uh, conflict between EU against national actors. It will lead to Euroscepticism. Um, and it, uh, but what we propose is that's a wrong debate. The debate should be about the policy orientations, commodifying, decommodifying, to go back to the classical left-right distinction in, in some sense. And, and, um, and that um, would would um, would uh, be uh, a more uh, effective approach, uh, because if we don't say anything, we uh, let uh, Meloni and others discuss Europe <laughs> along this national against Europe divide, which we have seen, and I think most nicely seen with the Pontius Pilatus type of argumentation about um, national competences in relation to the COVID funds. And so even the uh, Finnish and Nordic trade unions, when they heard that said, they were always in favor of national competence. They saw, you know, but that's when you use that in a Pontius Pilatus way, the competence argument, you see, it's not about competence, it's about left and right it's about commodification and decommodification and and in that sense i think we as academics we can play a role by just not as political active but just outlining what's going on and and showing what's going on then second point uh, of davy uh, what is the prospect of actions at the european level if we are already weak at the national level um uh, that is true, but on the other side, the executive is also weak at the European level. We should always think of the other side as well. So when you fight against uh, uh, an established nation state with 150 years of history, 
the the, uh, the 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 other side is also much more stable. The European Union is much weaker. The legitimacy of the European Union, European governance institution, is much weaker. So it actually needs less power to shift them. And and uh, the fact that they have adopted the European Minimum Wage Directive is an example. Another example is the European Citizens Initiative, where Imre Schabo and Tara Golden, uh, we wrote an article also in the Traboko Network, actually, where uh, getting 1 million signature, 1.8 million signatures for right, the right of water. Um, although this European Citizens Initiative had not the same legal power as the referendum abrogativo in Italy, it had a bigger impact because it led actually to the exclusion of water services from uh, the concession directive. So the European Commission realized, okay, let's, we want to commodify everything, but not water. Okay, we do in response, they took water out of the concession directive, uh, which is a success, which I, many people didn't actually suspect that it will happen, but it did have an impact. On the other side, there was also the European network that we have seen here, the European network, our health, not for profit, not for sale. They did actually during the COVID pandemic with Angelotto as a medic, uh, Democratia medic, uh, um, is part of that network as well. So they had a European citizens initiative um, that said there should be no profit on patients. And so, okay, um, uh, and then that action um, didn't succeed. They only got about 300,000 signature instead of 1 million. And, and therefore, um, uh, it also shows David's point. It's uh, good ideas is not enough. You, you, uh, to get 1 million signature to do an action together, you need, um, uh, it's not something that is uh, automatic. But the last of David's point, uh, which is also ironic, but it's I think it's very true that um, precisely because healthcare workers are not in competition with each other, they are more prone to act across borders. That's a contradiction to everything I've read in the last 20 years about the globalization, Europeanization of trade unions. It was always argued trade unions should become international, especially in the metal manufacturing sector, because they are now work together in, in across borders. But ironically, public sectors workers, and we did a database with Jörg Novak, we, we can confirm that in a paper that hopefully comes out soon with the European Journal of Industrial Relations, that actually the drivers of transnational protests are more public sector users and public sector workers than private sector uh, workers that work in, 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 in multinational corporations. But that, and even in case when some action happened, like in a successful action happened, like in the Ryanair case, where unions were able to work together and to win against Ryanair, uh, they did that, ironically, because of a weak European law that forced Ryanair to follow working time regulations of the EU, which then made it more difficult for them to break the transnational strike. So, so I think Europe is something that forces us to rethink many things. I don't think everything will be easier, but um, uh, it won't be easier for capital either. So it's a new phase for everybody and the struggle goes on. Uh, as it always goes on to capitalism. So we, we I don't have good news for that, but um, um, I wouldn't despair either. Thank you, Roland. Um, we still have a couple of minutes if anyone um, wants to join in. Otherwise, um, if you, Devi, want to say a couple of words more, otherwise, we are ready to close our our seminar thanking very much uh, Roland for this very important um, discussion opening uh, on the importance of uh, this transnational dimension that we um, tried 
to uh, shed light with with our uh, Trapoco network, which I hope will continue um, working together uh, beyond on this three years Erasmus plus uh, Jean Monnet uh, project and um, and expand uh, beyond this project because it's very evident that um, to start with we we need more awareness at the academic level and more awareness at public opinion to 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 make any political difference so thank you everyone thanks Luisa thanks Roland it was a pleasure <laughs> Thank you, everyone. You have the email of Roland and our, of course, email as you received the invitation. So 